Hello and welcome back to part two of episode two of Space Explorers, this time with Dr. Beth Healy. Welcome, Beth. Well, welcome back, Beth. Thank you, guys. Nice to be back. Oh, I'm really sad not to have been part of part one because it looked like you guys had a lot of fun. Well, we died. Courtesy of Lewis, which is why he's How do I... Yeah, yeah, he's left. Lewis I'm not gone. surprised at all that you Your replacement, Lewis. How's it feel? Uh, I feel actually like I've gotten smarter. Well, good. Much smarter, good. sitting in Lewis's seat. Um, but we're going to get even smarter still because we've got a lot of questions from ah. the audience. As put out in the last episode, we got a lot of questions, yeah. by the way. Like, tons. Although we did just go through them, and it looks like a lot of people want to know some really bizarre space facts. Yeah, there's some pretty niche, uh, niche yeah, knowledge yeah. there. That's okay. So uh, we've, we've <laughs> culled out a few. But we've left the gold. The gold is <laughs> Oh, <there>. obviously, the gold <laughs> yeah. is still there. <laughs> uh, but yeah, there were, there were one or two interesting questions. And we encourage the inqu interesting Absolutely. questions. But, uh, yeah. This time we're going to be focusing on the, the, sort of the medical side of, uh, of space. And Cam, do you want to fire us off with the first question? I could do that. So yes. the first uh, question is from <laughs> that vile gamer. He clearly <laughs> has a very low opinion of themselves. <laughs> anyway, they say, if, hypothetically, the military budgets for both EU and US for the next 10 years were allocated to a Mega Mars project, mm. I like the alliteration on the name of that project. Mega Mars. Good. Mm. Mega Mars. Well, that's not, what it would be called. Not just the Mars mission. <laughs> no. Yeah, like... Mega Mars. I, I would sign up for Mega Mars. Yes. Welcome yeah. to Project Mega Mars. <laughs> um, sorry, the question. How yes. far would we be at the end of those 10 years? All I, right. So, I appreciate mm. that we haven't started with a medical question. <laughs> so I We're guess, leading to those. I, I guess they don't want us to calculate and go and find out the budgets. But basically, Beth, if we had like all of the money, mm. Mm. could we conceivably get to Mars, do you think? In, in 10 years. I mean, w what is the, is the barrier just like funding and money or is it, is there still like technical questions we haven't answered? Um, I think I think it's a really interesting question. I mean, there's lots of things and barriers that we still have, but um, obviously with more research, then there's potential that we will be able to go further. And with more research and more funding to be able to do um, more experiments, then there's definitely the potential to get there a lot more quickly than we are at the moment. And I think there's often that question about whether we should be spending money sort of on all these big Mars missions and sort of scientific space research in general. And I think um, that it's really important that we all sort of remember that actually we learn a lot about a lot of different things from the research that we're doing. So just to give you an example, sort of the experiments that we're doing out in Antarctica, although they're sort of funded by space agencies and space related, there's a lot of stuff that we learn out there that is also really useful for us back here on Earth as well. And that's the same across the board with space research in general. Mm -hmm. So just like as an example, um, during the long polar night, we're looking at the effects of the artificial lighting on our eyesight. So for 105 days, we didn't see the sun. Um, and that's similar for obviously space flight as well. But it's also really similar for people people who are working for long periods of time in artificial lighting, so for example, sort of factory workers mm. and places like that. And so I think, although sort of the mission to Mars itself um, it can be questionable by some people, I think that it's undeniable that all the research that we're doing towards mm. these missions can help everybody. Yeah, yeah, I no, mean, absolutely. So, how was it living in the dark for six months? What's, weird, what's that like? weird. Yeah, I mean, it was really strange when the sun came back. It was an amazing sort of experience to have. Like, you suddenly had loads of energy, which was really great. And um, it's sort of weird, you know. The sun kind of really like connects you back with life back home. So, yeah. you know, whenever you look up in the sky, you see the sun. You've always got that familiar thing. But when you lose that, it really does feel like you're on a completely different planet. It's mm. really, really odd. Like, I find experience. it hard to wake up at the best of times in the morning <laughs> with the sun. I mean, how, how difficult was it just to get out of bed? Yeah, it's always I mean, dark. it's tough. So, like, I'd spent a lot of time up north um, in the Arctic and that sort of experienced the 24-hour sunlight. And also, during the summer in Antarctica, it's the same. And I was a little bit smug when I went down because I was like, oh, it's never affected me, you know, that 24-hour daylight. But yeah. turns out darkness does because it's a really different experience because you just can't quite wake up as you would normally. Mm -hmm. And so you sort of go into this weird kind of hibernation where you're sort of not quite awake, not quite asleep. And um, Is it's it like really hard to sleep. Is it like reverting back to being a student again where you, you basically <laughs> are awake? during you know darkness hours and you sleep during the day and that kind of like perpetual darkness yeah. i i say from experience <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's weird. You just don't have that point of reference. So it can be four in the morning or it can be lunchtime and you really don't know. And I mean, I've got some photos of sort of night and um, sort of nighttime, but they're taken at lunchtime. You know, you can see the Milky Way going out time any wow. time of the day. That's cool. But it was cool as well because you see all like the southern lights and all the things. Do you know the stars there. like really well now? Well, I mean, from a, from a South Pole perspective, can you can you point out all the constellations? Yeah. You must be bored of them. Maybe. I mean, we had like an astronomer on the base, so he well, was pretty yeah. keen to tell me. He must have been popular. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he spent all his time out in the 
sort of in his telescope. So we didn't see very much of him because he was just having such a great time. Was he w- was he indoors? You know, or did he have to wear? The, and I've seen the coat uh, that you had on <laughs> in the beginning. Was he like rugged up and just having a stand outside, freezing his eyes to a to a telescope out there? A bit of both. So he had like a little shelter outside, so he wasn't on the main station when he was doing his astronomy. So he'd go away from the base, but he did have. Was some that shelter. just for the minimal light pollution coming from the base, or was that for why? Why was he in a separate thing? Um, a bit of both, really. I mean, it's just where the sort of telescope was located. It okay. was better to have it away from the base, as you say, for light pollution and just just practically as well for the space. What about a mm. uh, like? Surely they're not like polar bears and stuff out there. You know, things that so, genuinely so could. Pop. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I don't know these things. When people said like, there are no penguins there. I'm like, are there? I don't know. Well, tell yeah. me. <laughs> it was there. What it, uh, is there any wildlife anywhere around the South Pole? Not at Concordia. There we so go. Concordia is right in the middle of Antarctica. Temperatures like minus 80, so nothing's surviving outside okay. there. And that's one of the experiments we're doing, actually. So we're looking to see if we can find any bacteria that's so survive Putting outside. various animals in the snow. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Closing the door. I was that under the impression cruel. that you, you spent <clears throat> some time at the North Pole as well. So I'm going to use that as the excuse. <laughs> so at the North Pole, I have seen a polar bear. And actually, this birthday, oh, cool. I got woken up by a polar bear trying to get into Happy the Happy birthday? Yeah. That's <laughs> wow. terrifying. I thought I it was someone making some tea and it just like knocked over the stove but apparently it wasn't it was, it was uh, a, a giant death mammal wow Absolutely the only terrifying. mammal that hunts people yeah. was there on your birthday brilliant wow all right that's terrifying so, we should yeah. we, we, we have to next slightly from the yeah. original question oh, but oh, no i did question. actually have a follow-up question to the to the mars project seeing okay. as this one is the only specifically mars question that we've okay. got here okay. uh which is that uh would you would you ever personally want to go to mars like do you have a dream of ever being in outer space yeah, it's funny. So before I went down south and sort of started working for ESA at Concordia, mm. it hadn't ever really been something that crossed my mind as something to do. But so then the more astronauts I meet and the more um, involved I get in the space research, I love that I term. Send... Yeah, you know, the more astronauts I meet, you know, <laughs> I'm <a> <laughs> tripping over them. <laughs> Everyone. Us too. Um, it's just, you know, you just realise that it's sort of normal people and it yeah. suddenly becomes a lot more achievable. And mm-hmm. it's like, wow, you know, I could do that too. And suddenly it has become a lot more of a sort of focus for me. And I've always been excited by sort of the idea of exploration. I guess mm-hmm. that's why mm-hmm. I went to Antarctica in the first place. And really, space is the next true place to explore. And for that reason, yeah. I find it pretty exciting. I mean, it's the ultimate sort Absolutely, of uh, getaway. Yeah. It's the one place <laughs> that we really don't know about. So it's, mm. I think it's really exciting. Awesome. All right, well, cool. now we can do next the next question. question. All right, so, <laughs> sorry, Seb, do you want to take the next question? Sure, yeah. So the next one is from TMT Industries. So a, <laughs> wow. a, it's a, a question from a full corporation here. Why? Yeah. <laughs> okay, taken by no your pressure, No pressure at all. Okay, so uh, extended time and space must have some consequences. If so, what issues would be worse, physical or psychological? Mm. Mm. Good question. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, so at Concordia, a lot of what we're looking at is more the sort of psychological effects. Mm -hmm. So we were doing physiological experiments as well, um, but it's really the psychological which we focus on because we have that sort of isolation which we can't recreate anywhere else on the Earth. Mm -hmm. And so that's the majority of what we're looking at. Um, So from that side of things, um, it's definitely more of the challenge at Concordia than the sort of physical aspects. Um, But, I mean, with all the microgravity as well, obviously we don't have that at Concordia so it's not sort of truly fair as a platform to sort of compare the two. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we still have a lot of work to do on both. Um, but certainly from the psychological perspective, we're coming up with lots of tools which can help us sort of overcome a lot of the problems that we sort of had in the past and sort of help astronauts with such a long mission. So I'm not, it's hard to say. And I mean, it depends on the trajectory as well and sort of how long the mission ends up being. And that mm-hmm. really depends on sort of technical technological advance as well. Sure. So I think so, at the moment is the, the, the longest anyone's ever been in space is for a full year. Isn't that right? Yeah, so it, well, I think we've had longer. I think I'm right in saying, are we? <laughs> 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 um, but so <clears throat> famously, it's around a year. <laughs> around a year. So we've had, yeah, famously, so Scott Kelly yeah. um, has just been up in space for a year long mm-hmm. mission. And that's really exciting because we're looking at sort of the effects of that longer mission mm-hmm. um, and sort of how that's affecting him based physiologically and psychologically and also a lot of the experiments that we're doing with Scott Kelly up in space we're doing actually at the same time down in Concordia as well Mm -hmm. I think it's really exciting that we're sort of starting to look a little bit further because obviously you know going a bit further away is not so far away in terms of actual time sure I I have another follow-up question to this as well which is uh, when you're thinking about putting people all in a giant space bubble 
that has you know any number of dangers attributed to it anything that could go wrong what's the what's to you what's the one thing that you're just like we must make sure that blank doesn't happen in terms of like mental health or something you know you, you know someone goes crazy and like eats all the rations oh, or something like that. <laughs> fingers crossed for that not to happen um, i think i mean that's the thing i think the psychological as long as you get the team right and mm. sort of everyone's happy then I think we can do it. But it's really that initial selection, getting the right people on board, and mm -hmm. I think we'll be all right. But so, to, to the question, do you think that's the bigger, bigger challenge than the physical stuff? I think so. Yeah. I think that's what's going to sort of hold us back, if anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the psychological challenge is really what we have to look at the most. All right, well I think in terms of, you know, physiological, there's lots of things that we can do to overcome that. Mm -hmm. um, sort of all the materials and training that we've got in place. But it's really going to be ultimately that psychological challenge, I think, which which is going to be the key. Mm -hmm. So what what are the kind of things that you do for astronauts in space to keep them in good physical health? Oh, so well, there's lots of things. There's also the sort of gym that we have, and, mm -hmm. and we're looking at like lunar habitats as well, sort mm -hmm. of lunar gyms. So, um, from that point of view, you know, we've, we've got lots of things to overcome the effects of the microgravity. Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of Concordia, we also have um, lots of tools which can help astronauts as well. So, more from a psychological perspective as well. So, mm -hmm. one thing that we were doing um, was like cognition testing, and so um, we we're developing a tool which um, looks at um, lots of different areas, so things like memory testing, um, risk taking behavior reaction times and really the idea is that astronauts can be doing on a regular basis testing themselves against themselves and it's just a bit of a red flag for mission control if they're dipping in performance and it just lets us look why are they dipping are they getting enough sleep are they having emotional problems um, things like that so mm -hmm. really just having all these tools which can help inform us about how people are doing and really sort of nip things in the bud early on before they become a big problem so detecting it before it is one. So prevention is obviously mm. the key. Um, Seb, do you want to read this one? <laughs> oh, <laughs> Mainly because the name I... Oh, it's uh, Tramiel Sparks, oh, who okay. says, uh, my question is, does your appetite or digestive system change in space over time? Mm. Um, okay. And uh, I mean, did you notice anything about your appetite when you were on um, Concordia? Yeah, definitely. I mean, as a crew, we all lost weight over the overwinter period. Really? And that was for a number of different reasons. So some, it can be sort of your morale and psychological state, because that can obviously affect your appetite. And mm -hmm. um, for me personally, it was more just during the long polar night. So being nighttime all the time, I just didn't really feel like eating. So it feels a bit like you're eating at like four in the morning, you know, you just okay. don't have that same kind of appetite. Um, and also the food is different as well. So you don't have any fresh fruit and vegetables. So, mm -hmm. And it's all very, so we have a chef actually at Concordia. So he does do a lot of good stuff with it, but you do sort of start to miss um, all the fresh stuff, which makes you sort of suppress your appetite a little bit it's, as well. It's something that I, I guess I hadn't really considered before that, it, you know, a chef would have a, a real place in the morale of the team there, oh, trying yeah. to make yeah, something yeah. interesting out of your limited supplies. Yeah, he's definitely the most important part of yeah. our crew. And I mean, that's something that we're looking towards for the space site as well. Mm. Of course, you've got, you know, the rocket science program that Tim Peake was doing and more and more looking at growing things in space and sort of making um, astronaut food a lot more healthy. Mm -hmm. And I think um, we actually, is with Andreas, the astronaut that went up recently, he actually took up sort of a full gourmet meal um, for all of his crew, which was really cool. And they had these little cookies with messages inside um, from oh. their wives, which was nice. It was a nice <laughs> sort of surprise, but also really good for the morale of the team. Yeah. And, and we're looking more and more at that kind of thing. Mm. But you're not allowed to grow grow anything on Concordia, are you? Yeah, it's a real shame, but because of the Antarctic Treaty, it means that we're not allowed to bring in anything to grow. So you're not allowed any soil. Um, some Antarctic bases do have hydroponic growing facilities. Mm -hmm. um, and during the Antarctic winter, actually, we do this thing, it's um, Transantarctic Darts Match. And so we okay. Skype with all the different bases. Um, halfway through the winter, we were Skyping with South Pole Station. Um, and halfway through the match, they brought out this huge watermelon. And you can imagine, Aww. after not having had any fresh fruit and vegetables for all that time seeing that was just such a mean thing to do and i was like wow i've definitely chosen the wrong base to be on so, so did you crush them at darts <laughs> the very retaliation I, I think we won actually good yeah. good <laughs> ha south pole so base take that melon <laughs> never, i never liked those south pole no, days, no, what was the terrible. first thing you ate when you came back um, the I, humble whisper bar. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, I had um, so it's mango and blueberries and avocado. Yeah, all, all just mushed together yeah, into a paste. Can't Sounds get enough good. of it. Yeah. <laughs> so the last question is: we're, we're still on this kind of consuming vibe, I guess. Yeah. But, but that, that must be one of the you know one of the biggest challenges about being isolated is is about food and drink. Mm -hmm. But this question is yeah. specifically about the latter. Yeah. Would you? Well, this is: would you get drunk more quickly or slowly in space? 
or would it be the same? Mm. Mm. And I want to tag on a bonus question of, are you like allowed to drink in these situations? Mm. You know, where everyone like locked away together. Maybe you know, you don't, maybe you don't want to include the influence of alcohol, or mm. or was it like, yeah, go crazy, get drunk? Well, it's a French Italian station, so there. Okay, <laughs> I see. So delicious so wine. I have a hypothesis on what you're about to say, but you go ahead. So there, yeah, there is alcohol at Concordia. Um, so and you know, and I think that's how it should be. It's not, it's not a prison. You know, you're sort of all adults there. Mm-hmm. Um, so in terms of would you get drunk more quickly? Well, that really just depends on the pressure and what pressure we end up having a space um, craft at going to Mars. Mm-hmm. So at Concordia, we're actually at altitude. So mm-hmm. we're 3,300 meters high. Wow. Um, and because you're actually in a polar region, it makes the barometric pressure sort of equivalent a bit less as well. So it's, oh, okay. it's equivalent of living at about 4,000 meters wow. in an alpine environment. Is that altitude sickness territory? Then. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, it's wow, it's okay. a bit like living on the top of Mont Blanc for a year. Wow. So we do have problems with people coming into Concordia. So flying from like the coast where you're at sea level straight mm-hmm. into Concordia, um, it's quite a big altitude jump, mm-hmm. and definitely, and that can affect you in terms of alcohol. At certainly. least, at least it's the you excuse, you know, careful. if you, you drink a bit too much and you're you're not feeling well the next day. Oh, it's altitude. Yeah, yeah. It's the altitude. <laughs> Definitely yeah, not all the beer. And we would definitely um, encourage not to drink on our first few days there just while we were climbing. I imagine. Used to it. Has anyone had a uh, South Pole hangover? Yeah. I think probably they have. Have <laughs> you had a South Pole hangover? Are you not oh, allowed to comment? I'm not. No comment. No, no comment. comment. Couldn't possibly Absolutely comment. Not, no. that means, no. <laughs> has has no. alcohol ever been to space, to your knowledge? Oh, I'm not sure, but yeah, I Yeah, have they, have they conducted the, you know, have they had the ISS part? Uh, yeah, international, but yeah, party. Well, obviously, obviously, we'd never be allowed to get drunk at space. Um, but I'm I'm not sure if they've taken say a never, little say bit never. of for science, I think though. something to do. Surely for science. Probably I'd imagine yeah. may have been yeah. up there, but I'm not sure. But uh, but you reckon the the you you reckon if you were theoretically up in space with a bottle of I don't know, whatever you like <laughs> <laughs> um, that maybe you would, you could potentially get a little bit drunker, a little bit quicker. But, but don't you also think because you know it messes with your balance when you when you drink alcohol? Would it not also potentially make you more likely to feel ill in zero gravity? That's Ooh, I think. I mean, you know, nausea could be a bigger but problem. But what if what if balance maybe, is already? I think we should propose this to NASA. Yeah. I know. I think we need to know. I'm prepared to do my <laughs> answers. Okay. Uh, what if? Uh, but what if your balance is already gone? What if if it's like you know flogging a dead horse at this point? You know, I see. Yeah, or pouring maybe. booze on a dead horse. Yeah. As it would be. <laughs> shouldn't be it's a waste of booze <laughs> it's a really big waste of booze <laughs> anyway we seem to have got slightly off topic but uh that is the end of, of our questions yeah but thanks very much dr beth healy for uh answering all these questions answering my questions i know i tend to ask more than the audience <laughs> in these That's kind okay. of it's been my pleasure it's been really fun it's your thirst awesome. for knowledge there. it is knowledge and booze exactly. and cake in, in all equal cake. measures yes <laughs> <laughs>